Lebanon's prime minister has announced his government's resignation. It comes nearly a week after the massive explosion that devastated much of Beirut and after days of angry protests. Demonstrators blame the country's ruling class for decades of widespread corruption and negligence. Lebanon's president accepted the government's resignation, but he also asked it to stay on in a caretaker role. Tuesday's explosion in Beirut's port killed at least 200 people. Reporter Rebecca Collard is on the ground watching these events unfold. The Lebanese prime minister has resigned tonight, but people are still in the streets and they are still very angry. They say after this blast on Tuesday that killed so many people and destroyed so much of their city, they want new elections under a new electoral law. I'm just going to show you behind me, the army now is coming towards us. We're just going to move out of the way. They've been trying to clear these protesters off the streets uh, for hours here. Here they are. Just Let's just walk with them. I don't know where they're, where they're running, but... As you can see, still a very tense situation tonight on the streets of Beirut after this resignation. People are angry. People are telling me they are going to stay in the streets. Beirut is devastated. Beirut is mourning, but it is also so angry. Rebecca Collard, CBC News, Beirut. So a big question is where does Lebanon go from here? Will this resignation satisfy the Lebanese people? Robert Malley is the president and CEO of the International Crisis Group. Mr. Malley previously served as a White House coordinator for the Middle East, North Africa, and the Gulf region in the Obama administration. Mr. Malley, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, the government's resignation, it was sudden, but it did follow this string of ministerial resignations. How surprised were you by this move? I, mean, I think the writing was was on the wall when you had a number of ministers, some of whom were were viewed as slightly more independent, uh, resigned. When you had the mass protests, it, it was the, the country was becoming virtually ungovernable. I think the, the prime minister was left with with little choice but to resign and now to govern in a caretaker capacity until a new government uh, takes its place. So your organization, the International Crisis Group, it characterized this explosion as an accident in name only. Why did you describe it that way? Because it's the fruit not of some natural event. It's the fruit of, well, f first and foremost, of the criminal negligence in leaving 30,000 tons practically of, of an explosive device in an area that could have at any point been uh, the subject of, of this kind of accident. And besides, we know that for the past many years, it's been there for six years, for the past many years, some officials at the port had been warning about it and saying something had to be done about it and no action was taken. So at a minimum, it is a case of criminal negligence, not an accident. But beyond that, it really is a reflection of a government, a government system, a state system that is profoundly corrupt, that is profoundly ill-governed, and uh, was never was was its, its its political class was looking more to enrich itself to entrench itself in positions of power rather than to govern effectively. And this is the very unfortunate disaster that is the fruit of all that. That's why we say it really is an accident in name only. Okay, so the government has has resigned, but some of the protesters are saying this isn't enough. They want the complete ouster of the country's political elite. elite. So more than just what has happened today, which is, is a significant move in and of itself. I mean, do you see an avenue here where the protesters' demands can be met? Well, I mean, you know, by definition, it's hard when the protesters understandably are demanding the complete dismemberment, dismantling of a political system that has operated by consensus among rivals. I mean, these are parties that were in a vicious civil war in the 1970s, a civil war that lasted over a decade, 15 years, and then came together in a system in which each elite member of the political class found a way to take advantage of, of the setup that was made. And so... Calling for the dismantlement of the system means that all of the political elite has to go. They're going to fight for their survival. They still have some support, and it's going to be a tug of war that's going to be very hard for the demonstrators, the protesters, uh, to win because they're facing a political class that, however divided it is, will unite on one goal, which is to preserve itself. We've seen countries like here in Canada offer aid uh, to trusted agents in the region to help with the recovery here. We've also seen French President Macron uh, speak to people in Beirut saying that uh, th there would be a new arrangement of some sort. I mean, w when you look at what needs to happen next, what role is there for the international community? What th should they be doing to help Lebanon right now? 
Well, the first thing is to provide humanitarian assistance, and as we and many others have uh, called for, and, and the, 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 the meeting that took place on Sunday, led by France, also called for, this aid has to go directly to the people, maybe going through civil society organizations that enjoy credibility, not in the hands of those who have uh, been engaged in predatory behavior for the past several decades. So that's step number one. I think step number two, as we argued in a report a few months ago, is to find a way to tie more significant assistance, the kind of assistance that the IMF can give, the kind of assistance that other countries can give, to some structural reforms to make sure that it will not, that the assistance won't be wasted and that it could serve to create a different Lebanon. But we have to keep some of that, those expectations in check. As I said, you're facing a system that will fight for its survival. And some of those who are fighting for their survival are heavily armed. I mean, you have an organization like Hezbollah, which is um, virtually a state within the state. And you have other organizations, other movements that without anywhere near that firepower also have a vested interest in maintaining uh, the status quo. So it will not, it will be an uphill battle. And hopefully some reforms can be taken and over time, uh, a more structural change in the in the governance of the of the country can take place. Uh, before we let you go, I have to ask you about another topic of great importance here in Canada, and that is about your colleague, Michael Kovrig. He and Michael Spaber have now been detained in China for more than 600 days. You're Mr. Kovrig's employer. Do you have any new information? Do you have any new understanding of how he is doing? Well, as you said, 610 days, I think, uh, today, 610 days during which Michael has not been able to see his family, to see the sunlight, even to see uh, to, to see anyone other than Canadian consulate officials. And what has happened since January, since COVID-19 struck, Chinese authorities uh, used that moment to say that he could no longer have access to his, to his uh, to consular access, which could have been understandable at the outset, but we're now several months into it since January. He still has not had consular access. That's a violation of, of his rights that needs to be remedied. He, they have, the Chinese authorities have, have worsened his conditions in terms of his access to the outside world, his ability to communicate to the outside world. So we're fighting together with Canada and others a two-front battle to improve his conditions of detention make them more humane, but most importantly, to get him out because he's being held as a pawn in what is, we have to call by its name, an effort by China to engage in hostage diplomacy, to get Ms. Mong, the CFO of Huawei, of the Huawei company who's being held in Canada on extradition charges to the US. Canada is using Michael and others, Michael Spavor as well, to try to get Ms. Mong out. That is wholly unjustifiable, wholly indefensible. And so it really is incumbent on Chinese authorities to let Michael go. Mr. Malley, do you have any reaction to the letter that was signed by a group of prominent Canadians earlier this summer urging the Prime Minister to simply release Ms. Meng in the hopes of getting the two Michaels back? Is that a helpful move? So we're not going to get involved in, in sort of the judicial and political decision that the Canadian government will take. Of course, as friends, colleagues of Michael, we want anything, everything to be done to get him out. We're not going to comment on that effort. It was one that Canadians are engaged in, a debate that Canadians engage in. For us, what matters is to get him out. And we know that the Canadian government is committed to that, and we hope that they will do everything within their power to bring forward the day where, where Michael will be reunited with his loved ones. Robert Malley, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. That's Robert Malley with the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Vashi Capellos, host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.